Um, so, well, it's very nice to be here again. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to congratulate Alex on reaching the venerable age of 60. And a lot was said about Alex, what a fantastic influence he's been on a lot of people here. And I'd just like to second that. Certainly, meeting Alex broadened my outlook on mathematics in several directions. He had this way of <coughs> seeing things, seeing that things might work when nobody expected them to work. So we certainly got a lot more insight in how to approach problems about infinite groups using strong approximation and periodic analytic groups and all that sort of thing, which is very much due to Alex's vision. So thank you for that. Thank you also for providing a finishing school for most of my good doctoral students. When, <laughs> when they'd had enough of me, they all came here and worked with Alex and were much improved by the experience. I don't know if he was improved or worn down by it, but he seems to have survived. <coughs> so thank you, Alex, and thank you, everybody. Yeah. Hmm? I was also quite interested to hear Peter Sarnak's story yesterday about the, the book project, because when Alex, Alex's first book won a prize, and he got a lot of money and bought a car, and after about 10 years, he decided he needed a new car. <laughs> <laughs> so he said to me, Dan, we're going to write a book <laughs> and put it in for that prize. <laughs> so, and he was a, a firm taskmaster, but a fair one, and I think we produced quite a decent book. Actually, I think it was very unfair because although we won the prize, we only won half the prize. We had to share it with somebody else. And our book was four times as thick as the other one. <laughs> but we still only got half the prize money. So poor Alex couldn't buy a new car. He could only buy some new tires, I think. <laughs> still, it's been great working with you and great to see you still as full of energy as ever. And, um, right, perhaps I should go on to my talk. I don't feel as full of energy as ever, so I think I've got to that sort of twilight stage where I can, I can ramble on about interesting theorems I once proved. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this is what I'm going to do today. But I hope there may be some interesting questions <laughs> which arise out of it. So the topic is called Strongly Complete Profinite Groups. So you start with a profinite group G. And... This has, it's a group and it has a topology. It's a topological group. And if you forget the topology, this is a profinite group. If you forget the topology, you have an abstract group, which I'll just call GA just for now. So it's the same group, but it doesn't have any topology. Abstract group, forget topology. Okay, and of course, there's a group homomorphism here, which is the identity. It's the same thing. But then, whenever you have a homomorphism of groups, you get an induced homomorphism on profinite completions. So, where are we? Let me just. Yeah, so here's G. Here is the profinite completion of G. Just. Uh, so I've got it the other way around. We start off with, no, we start off with a profinite group. I've, I've, done, I've done the wrong picture. Here's. I just start. G is a profinite group. So I, I drew a different picture from what was in my notes, which is why I'm confused now. Perhaps I should leave it here. Here's the profinite group G. Here's the abstract group GA. Now, GA is an abstract group. It has a profinite completion. That's what I'm saying. Okay? And there's a natural map from a, from a group to its profinite completion. And there's the identity map here, that's what I'm saying. Because G, the profinite group, is the same group as G, A, the abstract group. And so which way do I want to do it? 
So you have an induced map there from, from uh, this, from the profinite completion of GA to any profinite group into which GA is mapping. That's what I was trying to say. Okay, which happens to be G. Right. And this is obviously onto. Okay? It isn't always injective. It has a kernel, or it might have a kernel, which you could call the congruence kernel. You might say the congruence subgroups here are the ones which are really belong <coughs> to the topology, the open subgroups. Uh, but there may be some others. And what the congruence kernel, of course, is measuring is, is it gives you a picture of the subgroups of finite index which might not be open the difference between those subgroups and their closures. Okay, so this is just kind of a setting the picture. So in general, did I give this a name? Let's call it exclamation mark. In general, this exclamation mark is not injective. It's always surjective. C, if you like, measures measures non-open finite index subgroups. Okay, so the title of my talk was Strongly Complete Profinite Groups. And we say the group's strongly complete if this is trivial. In other words, if, if the group as a profinite group is actually the profinite completion of itself just as an abstract group. So if C equals 1, G equals G A hat, equals in the sense that the natural mapping is actually an isomorphism. Uh, is said to be strongly complete. You could also call it rigid. It says, what it says is that every homomorphism from G to any other profinite group is necessarily a continuous homomorphism. So all group homomorphisms, G to profinite, are continuous. Okay, so that's the, what we're talking about. And at least in some sort of abstract, hand-wavy way, it might be an interesting question. Does this ever happen? Does it usually happen? And so on. What can you say about these groups? So it's easy to make examples where it does happen. Ah, there we are. So examples. Take any sequence of finite groups, A n. That doesn't mean the alternating group, it's just a group called A. And let's suppose they have co-prime orders, just to make it very simple. And then you look at the Cartesian product of all these groups. And it's very easy to see that if you map this thing to any finite group, almost all of these are going to get mapped to one. And from that it's very easy to see that every, every homomorphism from this to a finite group is going to be continuous and therefore the same will work for profinite groups. So this is strongly complete. So uh, it's often a good idea if you're looking for something that might be true about profinite groups, the first place to look is take an infinite product of finite groups. Because that, that's kind of a, a toy model of a profinite group. Nothing much is happening, but there is a topology. So that's on one side, strongly complete groups. On the other side, it looks similar, but it's not quite the same. So suppose take A be a finite group, non-trivial, 
And let G simply be product of infinitely many copies of the same group, kind of the opposite situation of this. So you could think it's product of all n, a n, where each a n is isomorphic to a now. So again, this is a profinite group with a product topology. And so you use it to make an ultra power. So that you'd be a non-principal ultra filter. On n, and then you take the product of these things over the ultra filter to get an ultra product. And then, yeah, so G maps onto that. Uh, OK, now, uh, oh, yeah, let K be the kernel of this thing then this is certainly a dense subgroup because every product of finitely many of these things is going to be trivial in the ultra power. So K is a dense subgroup and on the other hand, oh, it has finite index, that's the other thing. Sorry, this is, this is the whole point. If you take an ultra product of isomorphic finite groups, the result is isomorphic to the group you started with. Because being isomorphic to A is a first order property of groups. Because A is a finite group. OK, so K is finite index. K is a normal subgroup of finite index in G. That means finite index. And K is dense. So here's a normal subgroup which has finite index and is not open. So G is not strongly complete. So here are two very straightforward situations which give you the opposite ends of the spectrum for this property. So sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. OK, so let's look at generalizing in both directions. Did I do enough magic to have more space? I did. No, I didn't. No, all right. We'll have to wipe. Okay, let's generalize the first example in some sense and find a, a nice condition, a sufficient condition for a profinite group to be strongly complete. So, gen generalizing one. So, now we're going to, this is going to involve verbal subgroups. So, a group variety. This is just a name which I concoct for this lecture. Let's say it's special. So a variety of group is a, the class of all groups which satisfy some set of identities defined by some set of words. So let's say it's special if it's generated by some finite group. A group variety V if V is generated by some finite group. You say. So that means that a group belongs to the variety V if it satisfies all the identities that are, satisf that are satisfied by this particular group Q. Let's call that a special variety. So a simple example is if you take all the groups which satisfy this law, every commutator and every pth power is one. So this is generated by the cyclic group of prime order. And that gives you all elementary abelian p groups. That's, that's a special variety. That's a sort of example. OK, so if G is any group, you can define the verbal subgroup. Let's call it v, v of G is the biggest normal subgroup. Now, the smallest normal subgroup, such that the quotient belongs to the variety. So V of G is verbal subgroup. corresponding to V, so it's the subgroup generated by all values 
W an identity of the variety and G in, well, some power of G, some tuple. <coughs> take all the values of the word. So if you take the subgroup generated by all commutators and pth powers, that's the verbal subgroup corresponding to this variety. Sorry? It's a subgroup of G. Yeah. It's a subgroup of G. So if, if, v is a, if V is abelian groups, for example, <coughs> so V is a variety, okay? It's a class of groups. Where are we? A group variety V. I haven't talked, um, special is a particular subclass of varieties. So v, example, e.g., if V is the class of abelian groups, then for any group G, V of G is the derived group generated by the values of the commutator. So it's the smallest normal subgroup such that the quotient is abelian. Okay, so this is the verbal subgroup. Right. Okay, now, suppose you have a subgroup of finite index in a group G. It contains a normal subgroup of finite index. That quotient is a finite group. Then every word which vanishes on that finite group, all its values are going to sit inside that normal subgroup. That's kind of obvious. So if, if you're not familiar with this, it may not be clear, but I'll let me just write it up, what I want to say. So, so let me just say it's clear, if you think about it for a moment, that... If G is a profinite group, and if V of G is open in G for every special variety V, then what? That means every, sub, every subgroup of finite index contains one of these verbal subgroups. These are all open. Therefore, every subgroup of finite index is open. Then G is strongly complete. This is a kind of obvious observation, but it's quite important because this is you're beginning to look at some algebraic structure of the group these these are defined by defined by word values so you then ask yourself what does it mean for a subgroup defined by a set of word values to be an open subgroup and at least you're beginning to get your teeth into the question you're beginning to you know moving slowly away from abstract topological concepts to something with a bit of algebra in it Okay, so as I say, this is kind of obvious once you've formulated it. But what's amazing, I think not very widely known, but I think is very beautiful, is the theorem of Mike Smith and John Wilson from, I think, uh, 2003. That this condition is necessary and sufficient. So let me call this star. V is up, right? For every special variety, let's let's call this condition star. Star is necessary and sufficient. For G, profinite group to be strongly complete. As I say, sufficiency is obvious, the necessity is not at all obvious. It's quite a subtle argument. And I particularly like it because, as I said, once you understand what it... you can understand algebraically what this means. So it gives you a characterization in algebraic terms of something which looks very topological. You know, the statement that all group homomorphisms are continuous. 
This depends on something purely algebraic, and I can spell it out. I'll, I'll do this just once because it kind of motivates motivates what we're doing really. My way of thinking about profinite groups is that any statement about a profinite group is actually literally equivalent to a statement about a family of finite groups, namely the, the set of all continuous finite quotients, because the set of continuous finite quotients determines the group, which is its inverse limit. Okay, so you can ask yourself, what statement, if you have some thing about a profinite group, it's com strongly complete or whatever, or if it's generated by two elements, that's a statement about a topological group, topological generation, it means something about a whole family of finite groups. But you can't say anything topological about finite groups, they're just finite groups. So there's some algebraic fact about this collection of finite groups which is equivalent to that. So what is the algebraic fact? To say that the group that G is generated topologically by two elements is equivalent to saying that each of these finite groups can be generated by two elements. If you want to say a qualitative thing, that the profinite group is finitely generated, that's equivalent to saying there exists a D, there's a uniform bound D, such that all these finite groups can be generated by D elements. Okay, so what is the algebraic fact corresponding to that, this statement? G is, G is um, strongly complete. Well, the algebraic fact is that the verbal subgroup is open. Now, what does that mean? So let a subgroup H of a profinite group G, not an a subgroup of the abstract group G is closed is uh, closed no, that's not enough or rather it's too much let me just state the results because I don't want to spend too long on this right let's just for simplicity talk about <coughs> let's suppose the variety V is defined by one word, W. In fact, it's a theorem that it is, but we don't need it. But just for simplicity, let's suppose it is. Not all varieties have this property. In fact, as Slava Grigorchuk mentioned, there are uncountably many varieties. So this can't be true for all varieties. But it's true for varieties generated by a finite group, which is, again, a deep theorem, Oates and Powell. But we don't need it, but I'll, I'll just assume this for simplicity. Then. <coughs> Uh, then V of G is what's called W of G. It's generated by the values of W. is closed in G if and only if every element of this subgroup, well, elements of this subgroup are products of values of W, and the set of such products is closed if and only if the products have bounded length. So if and only if W has finite width. <coughs> in G. So, in other words, i.e. W of G is GW. I'll just use this notation star K for some K. And that means the set of all products of length K. Products of length K of things of the form WG or their inverses. It's easy to see that a set like this is closed because it's compact, because the verbal mapping from G to W of G to the set of values is a, is a continuous map, so its image is compact. So these are obviously closed, and then a, a bare category theorem argument gives you the converse, that if this subgroup is closed, it's, it's going to be the ascending union of a countable train of things like this, and one of them will have to contain an open set, and then <coughs> it actually, the train has to become finite. Okay, so this is an algebraic statement about this being closed, and once it's closed, to say the subgroup is open simply means that its closure has a certain finite index, which means that its image in all of the finite groups we started with has bounded index. Okay. So, we can now have this
so so let's say let curly f of g be the set of all open normal subgroups in G. So the set of quotients by open normal subgroups. So it's a set of continuous finite quotients. So G, this is a family of finite groups. It's an inverse system. So G is naturally isomorphic to the inverse limit of F of G, as I said. You have a family of finite groups, which is the same thing as G, really. And then so the criterion, if you like, from this Smith and Wilson theorem says that G is strongly complete if and only if for every special variety V uh, defined by a word W, there exist constants M and F such that A, W has width less than or equal to F in Q for all Q in F of G. Because to say that a word has width f in the profile group is easily seen to be this equivalent to having bounded width in all these finite images. And b, so that, that gives you the closure. That tells you that the verbal subgroup v of g is closed. And the second one is that if you take the verbal subgroup in these finite images, that has bounded index. So, of course, this is not something you can check because there are infinitely many parameters, infinitely many varieties you have to check and infinitely many subgroups and so on. But just the point of it is that this is a purely algebraic statement about a family of finite groups. It's equivalent to this rather abstract-sounding topological statement. Of course, if you want to verify it for a particular kind of group, that's another problem. So... What I, when I saw this, I thought, can we simplify it a bit? Again, it's not going to... You can never turn it into a finite condition. But at least, maybe you could make it a bit more elegant. And less complicated. So there's another... We can forget about special varieties and just think, every finite group has finite exponent. So instead of sp special varieties, we could think of just powers, verbal, uh, what they call, Burnside varieties. Okay, so example, the first example I gave of a strongly complete group depended on the fact that all these finite groups we started with had co-prime orders. And then the, the argument then works by saying that if you map to a finite group of exponent n, nearly all of them are going to get mapped to one. So we can sort of, can we just generalize this idea? So let's say, let's just define G sub Q to be the set of Qth powers. So let Q, Q be some fixed natural number. G sub Q is the set of Qth powers. Okay. Right, so in my first example, this, for each Q, this set contains an open subgroup, namely the product of almost all the other factors, almost all the factors. Okay, so can we generalize this in any reasonable way? So let's say G to the Q is the subgroup generated by the Qth powers. So that's the verbal subgroup for this, this so-called Burnside variety. <coughs> verbal subgroup for the word X to the Q. Okay. So again, clearly, if G to the Q is open in G for all Q natural numbers, then G is strongly complete. 
the same argument. Every subgroup of finite index will contain one of these. Does this often happen? Ah, now we come to a theorem. I proved with Nick a few years ago. This is not the first way we proved this strong completeness, but this is the most elegant or shortest way of putting it, if you like. Suppose if, if G is a finitely generated profinite group, topologically finitely generated, if G is a finitely generated profinite group, then G to the Q is open. natural number q. So in so that as a corollary you get finitely generated implies strongly complete. This is a, a famous question of Serre. Okay, so this is nice obviously but after a while you and stop feeling pleased with yourself and say, what do we do next? So I thought, well, does it have a converse, this one? Because if it did, that would be... A In some philosophical sense, it's not very different from this thing with special varieties. But it's kind of cleaner. But, of course, the, pro the problem is that these... <coughs> this... Uh, the Burnside variety is not a special variety. The free groups are usually infinite. So, it's in, in, in one, some ways it's easier to use, but in other ways it's very difficult to use. Because these Burnside groups are horrible. Okay, so, let me call this... Uh, that first statement was star, let me call this double star. So the question is, does double star have a converse? Okay, there's a... Actually, to be honest, I didn't think of that first of all. What I thought of first of all was something else which led to it. So now let me talk about the something else. Quite a few years ago, when Nick and I were going around talking about this theorem, or rather that one, people would sometimes ask, do we need to assume finite generation? Could we assume a weaker condition? And one property that finitely generated groups have is that they only have finitely many subgroups of each finite index. So a finitely generated profinite group has only finitely many open subgroups of index n for every n. Such a group is sometimes called small. And unlike finitely generated groups, these groups really come up in number theory. There's the GABA groups of, of um, ex al algebraic extensions of Q with most primes are unramified, you fix the ramification. And I think it's an open problem whether these groups are finitely generated. I don't know if it's yeah, a... Sometimes called Shafarevich conjecture, isn't it? Though I was asking about Fincher again. Yeah. I asked you... Where, where did Shafarevich... Are you using the same idea? Uh, don't yes, I don't know. Yes, no, no, I've only heard people mention it. I've never actually seen it written down. So, anyway, that seems to be a very difficult question. And I, I thought about it, I thought... Does knowing a bit of group theory help? And it doesn't. You, you really got to do some really hard number theory for that one. Yes, but this question of small. So G is small. So G is going to be a profinite group unless otherwise stated. It's small if... I'll just write normal triangle little o for open normal subgroup. If the normal subgroups of index n, there are only finitely many of them. If 
in fact, let me say less than or equal to n. And this number is called Sn of g. Okay, if, if Sn of g is finite. Okay, so when, when I was thinking about this question, is a small profinite group necessarily strongly complete? And the answer is no. The, the, it's the, to show that the answer is no isn't completely obvious. It's not, not hugely difficult, but you have to think about it a bit. I mean, you have to use some of these criteria. Um, and I hope I'll have time at the end to show the sort of examples which show that. But what can you say about small groups? Can we say anything sort of similar to that? And so here's a, a small theorem, which I put on the archive a few years ago. which is this. Uh, okay, let me th say one thing. Um, if every... Okay, if g to the q is open for every q, then g is strongly complete. Suppose we assume only that the closure of g to the q is open. That means that every open normal subgroup of order q, dividing q, say, is going to contain this thing, and therefore will have bounded index. So the group will be small. OK? Bar means closure. So what I, what I noticed was that the converse is also true. So g is small if and only if g to the q bar is open. The closure of... Um, the group generated by the qth powers. G small, if and only if g to the q bar is open for every q, every natural number q. And that's, it's not, it's not, it's not a deep theorem, but it's not a trivial theorem. It uses a whole, the whole Higman reduction that they use for, for, um, for the restricted Burnside problem. And in fact, it, this is actually a generalization of the restricted Burnside problem, if you think of it the right way. I don't know if Yefim is here. Oh, he's having a well-earned nap, perhaps. But I'm sure he could see immediately why this generalizes the restricted Burnside problem. So this is what kind of motivated me. I said, OK, if, this is, if, if, G's, if G is strongly complete, it's certainly small. That's quite easy to see. And therefore, this holds. And so I was, I was interested in that sort of family of ideas. And I, I made a sort of diagram of, of um, implications. Perhaps I'll do it here. We'll remember that. So... So here are various criteria or conditions that a profinite group might apply, might satisfy. So I'm going to put different kinds of arrows. And do you have colors? Well, never mind. And there's another one here which I'll just mention briefly. Very small.
Okay, my convention is that a single arrow with a tick means that something is elementary, obvious, or folklore, or not particularly deep anyway. A double arrow means that someone's proved a hard theorem. And I'm, I've mentioned all of them actually, apart from this one, which is also, also Smith and Wilson, Smith and Wesson. Very small means that the abstract group GA is small, which is a kind of beautiful statement that a profile group is strongly, if it's strongly complete, it's certainly small, or there are any boundedly many finitely many subgroup, open subgroups of each finite index, but of course open subgroups of each index. But if, if the group's strongly complete, this accounts for all the subgroups of finite index. So there are only, countably, there are only finitely many subgroups of each finite index in the abstract group. And what Smith and Wilson prove is that the converse is also true, that if there are finitely many abstract subgroups of, of each finite index, the group's strongly complete. And in fact, more generally, they prove that if there are only countably many subgroups of finite index. They must all be open, which is kind of not, not so surprising and quite beautiful. But uh, this is very far from what I think of as an algebraic property of the finite groups you started with. Because... So sorry? There are only countably many... You're doing it in your head. Finite index... S subgroups. Yeah, it's not trivial. Ah! My, my wake up call to Alex. No, no, so it seems like. Uh -huh. yeah. I was about to ask you, and now it seems like it, uh, just let me check if this is an answer. I plan to ask you a question. The question is whether the congruence kernel is always either trivial or huge. I think the answer is almost certainly yes. From this. It can never yes. be finite like in the, in the classic. It can't even be countable, yeah. Not, not even. Uh, uh, what, not even uh, well, of course, it's a profinite group, isn't it? So it can't no, be no, obvious, but, but, but yeah, can be it can't be finite. No, I don't think so. From can this it, result, yeah. Can it be finitely generated? I haven't thought about it. Maybe Probably not. So anyway, there's lots of equivalences here. Obviously, not that one, because I've given you examples of strongly complete groups which aren't finitely generated, uh, which satisfy this, in fact. Okay, but. Um, what about, so, I've got an equivalence here, not an equivalence, yeah, it's almost, you can almost go around in a circle, okay, certainly this again is not the same, but my question is this one, does a strongly, in a strongly complete group, are the power subgroups actually going to be open? From this theorem, it's equivalent to saying, are they closed? because their closures always are open. Okay. So this is a question about finite groups. I mean, a kind of ridiculously abstract question about finite groups. It says, if, if a family of finite groups, or an inverse system of finite groups, will satisfy this criterion about the verbal subgroups, having the, ver the, ver uh, the one I put there, the complicated criterion, do in fact the power words have finite width, bounded width? Okay, so I, th I think probably the answer is no, and this is my wake-up call to Alex. I imagine he'll, he'll find a counterexample during the rest of this lecture because he's good at My experience in this, actually in this lecture hall, is that when somebody puts up a problem at the beginning of the talk, by the end Alex says, what about this? Right, so, so this is the problem. Does strongly complete, does G strongly complete imply that G to the Q is open or equivalently closed for all natural numbers Q? So th that is an open problem. And since I, we didn't start at, at uh, 1040, did we? Not really. So I shall carry on a bit for a few more minutes. Though I shall try to speed up. So uh, the, the the point I was saying though that to say this is so equ so equivalently again the power words x to the q 
have bounded width. I have finite width. in the profinite group or bounded width in the finite groups. OK, now, so I asked this question in a lecture a few years ago. John Wilson was in the audience, and afterwards he said, I suppose you must have, I suppose you've realized that it's enough to do this for prime powers. And I hadn't, actually. It's a very beautiful observation. So here's, but it's, so here's a, let's call it a proposition. Sorry? You mean independent of the number of generators of the group? Well, the group's infinitely generated. What? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the groups don't have a bounded number of generators. Sure, independent, yeah. Yeah, the width. Yeah, if you fix the number of generators, right. there's a very important theorem which says that it's bounded. Yeah. Our theorem. <laughs> the theorem I thought of on the bus on the way to so Oxford. The proof. The the Not for all groups. No, no. If the groups, if the groups define a strongly complete profinite group, of course it's not true for all groups. Yeah. So in other words, if this if this equivalent condition on on these special subgroups, the verbal subgroups corresponding to special varieties, if they all have finite width, should that imply that the power words have finite width? The point is the power words don't come from a finite group because the Burnside groups are infinite. I mean, this is the kind of the, the subtlety there. So John Wilson said that pointed out that this is not completely obvious, but if you understand the proof of my result about small groups using this whole Higman machinery from the restricted Burnside problem world in finite groups, the same machinery will give you this thing, which reduces this question to, to prime powers Namely, suppose G is a profinite group. No, G is a strongly complete. Suppose G just, you don't, don't actually need this, but to make the statement simple, suppose G is strongly complete, and suppose that, oh, let me, let me say, uh, let me say that G is, Q closed, if this holds, just, just for a convenient, note, a convenient way of describing these properties. G is Q closed means that the subgroup generated by the Qth powers is a closed subgroup. OK. Uh, G is, or, uh, well, again, the, the power word x to the Q has finite width. If G is strongly complete, and we suppose that G is, no, that N is Q closed, you have to do this for all open normal subgroups. N is Q closed for every open normal subgroup N of G and every prime power Q. Then G is Q closed for every integer Q. So this uses this whole Higman type reduction plus a deep fact, which is namely Nick and my theorem that that uh, finitely generated profinite groups have this property, which tells you that if you take an arbitrary profinite group and you factor out the qth powers, any finitely generated subgroup of that will be the image of a finitely generated profinite subgroup whose qth powers will have to give you an open subgroup, so that this is locally finite. This is for any any profinite group, and that any profinite group has that property by Nikolov Siegel. Okay, so that's prime powers. So let, I'm going to run out of time. So let me just say quickly what's the story with prime powers. And here's some beautiful and deep work of Nikolai, which I think is probably on archive, or some of it is anyway. So here's a theorem. Uh, let me make a definition. A finite group G, no, yeah. A 
finite group G is an abelian. I thought of this word, I think it's rather nice. If it has no abelian composition factors, if it has no cyclic composition factors. So it's actually built up out of non-abelian finite simple groups and a profinite group with all its continuous finite quotients have this property. Okay, so he, he proved this thing about anabelian groups. Right, so if let Q be any natural number. No, sorry. <laughs> let Q be an odd If 2 does not divide q, or q equals 2 to the n, for some n. <coughs> then there exists f, which depends on q, such that the word x to the q has width at most f in every finite and abelian group. Yes, that's the whole point. Yeah. That's the whole point. If you fix the number of generators, we've done it, right, for all for all q. But this is for odd q, and it's not. And the beautiful thing is, it's not true for. If this does, it's not true for. When q equals thirty, he, he has a, a beautiful generic construction for numbers like this, like exponents of non-abelian simple groups. A beautiful generic construction using Greek products to show that. Um, this can't happen. Anyway, luckily, all prime powers are included in this family of numbers. So if you then apply this to, to my original question and this reduction, we can deduce that for anabelian profinite groups, this is now true. OK? Uh, yeah. So if you stick to profinite groups without abelian composition factors, this is actually an equivalence. So we can say, here's a <coughs> theorem. If G is an abelian, an abelian, then G is strongly complete if and only if G is Q-closed. all Q in N. Okay, so that, that's very nice. So what the question is then, on the other side, what, it should be easier to deal with prosoluble groups, but we can't get anywhere. No idea how to do it. My, my sort of tease for Alex was that Alex would probably think of a counterexample using finite simple groups. But whilst, when he's struggled with that for a bit, I'll then tell him that it won't work with finite simple <coughs> groups because of Nick's beautiful result here. OK, how are we doing for time? There was one more thing I wanted to say. Oh, yeah. So this is my sort of general open question. And here's something which would do, which would solve the problem for prosoluble groups and lots of other problems. It is almost certainly not true. So it does. So here's a question. Let P be a pro P group. Can P have a non-trivial perfect quotient? Let me say P abstract to make it clear. Can there be a homomorphism, a group homomorphism, from a pro P group to a perfect? So perfect means uh, perfect. It's a group Q such that Q is generated by commutators. Because essentially you're looking for an infinite per perfect quotient, right? Or a... Well, a finite... It can't be. It can't, you can't have a finite perfect No. Right? No, you can't. Yeah, so Not for a pro-P group. For an a, fini a finite quotient of a pro-P group is a finite P group. Whether the P group is... Uh, that's, all, that's an easy observation. And a finite P group can't be perfect. 
So your question is, yeah, yeah. What you say is correct, but, but kind of clear. So the point is, if the answer, it, we've thought quite hard about trying to construct such an example. It seems very difficult to get one's teeth around it. Um, if the answer is no, then that would solve this problem also for, for um, pro-soluble groups. Because in a pro-soluble group, G is a pro-soluble group. You look at G to the Q, where Q is a prime power. This is covered by a silo pro-Q subgroup. And it's very easy to see that then the, the, the closure of G to the Q is an open normal subgroup. Take a silo pro-P pro subgroup of this bit. That's a pro -P, that's a, that will be a perfect infinite quotient of, a, of the silo pro-P subgroup, pro-Q subgroup. So, so this would answer that question, but I think probably the answer is this can happen, but we don't have any idea how to do it. Maybe somebody else here will do. Anyway, I think I should stop, so thank you very much. Lebski, he's here. Le yeah, Lebski, yeah, yes. This, uh, this criterion using the fourth uh, finite groups. So I think that might. I'm not sure. You may be right. There certainly is a criterion where you're looking at a quotient of a profile of a, inside a free pro finite group, aren't you? Mm -hmm. But I, I can't answer that standing up. Let, let me just mention a, a conjecture. You mentioned an abelian group, so so uh, so we conjecture that an abelian groups satisfy, you know, finite satisfy or a conjecture every element of an an abelian group. In fact, you you, but, you, you, know, we we you submitted it, a paper with it. I know, I was the editor. Yes, but there was a mistake. So so this is a, a very nice challenge uh, extending the or Right. Well, what Nikolai has proved is that there's a bound it width. for the... Bound it width, yes. I think Nikolai Contator has proved that, that yes, commutator width yes, is it bounded. Yeah. Bounded width, but it's bounded width, but, but not necessarily one. one yes. yes. Okay. So the commutator width should be one for an abelian yeah, groups. I presume that depends on the classification of finite subgroups. Uh, yes. Yeah. It depends on all the stuff we were doing. It's similar to the kind of stuff we did before. Just more of the same. Though. Gets hard. Yes, thank you. Thank you again.